couple of years after the Death Star exploded, a hotshot reporter at the Daily Planet heard that children in the Shire were starting to act a little bit strangely. So your supervisor sent some of his grad students off to collect some data. Things didn't go so well for them, but their notebooks were recovered and later transcribed. Your job is to read in 20 or 30 files, each of which contains several hundred measurements of background evil levels, and convert them into a uniform format so they can be processed further. Each of the readings has the name of the site where the reading was taken, the date the reading was taken on, and of course the background evil level in millivators. The problem is these files aren't formatted in the same way. Some of them use tabs to separate fields, others use commas, and the dates are written in several different styles. Let's take a look at one of those files. As you can see, it uses a single tab between each column as a separator, and while the spaces and site names are visually similar, they're different characters. The good news is the dates are written in the international standard format, four digits for the year, two for the month, and two for the day. Let's have a look at the second notebook. Here, they're using slashes as separators. There don't appear to be spaces in the site names, but the month names and day numbers are of varying length, the months are text, and the order is month, day, year, rather than year, month, day. Parsing these files using string search would be difficult and error prone. The right solution is to use regular expressions. A regular expression is just a pattern that a string can match. And you've probably used these already. When you say star.txt to a computer, you're matching all of the file names that end in .txt. The star matches any number of characters. It's a pattern. Now I'll warn you before we go any further, the notation for regular expressions is ugly, even by the standards of programming. The problem is that we're writing patterns to match strings, but we're writing those patterns as strings, using only the symbols that are on the keyboard, instead of inventing new symbols the way mathematicians often do. Let's start by reading in data from two files and grabbing the first few lines of each. When we print out the results in the list readings, we can see that we've got six lines from the first data file and six from the second. We'll test our regular expressions against this data to see how well or how poorly we're matching different formats of records as we go along. Now, without regular expressions, we can select records that have the month 06 just by saying if 06 is in the record. If we want to select data for two months, we have to say if 06 in the record or if 07 in the record. Now, we should realize that there's a problem here. If we say 05 in record, it isn't matching against the month. It's matching against the day. Right now, we have no easy way to distinguish those two cases. And this is a problem we'll come back to later. Let's try using a regular expression to do our matches instead of the simple string in operator. We import the regular expressions library and then say for each record, if regular expression search can find a match for the string 06 in the record, then we'll print it out. Now so far, this is matching exactly what 06 in R would match. It's not much of an improvement. But look what happens if we want to match a month of 06 or a month of 07. We can combine the two in a single pattern. Let's take a closer look at this code. The first argument to re.search is the pattern we are searching for and that pattern is written down as a string. The second argument is the data we are searching in. Now it's quite common to get these reversed. A very common mistake is to put the data first and the pattern second. This can be quite hard to track down so please be careful. The vertical bar in the pattern means OR. We're telling the regular expression engine that we want to match either the text on the left of the vertical bar or the text on the right, but we're going to do the match in a single search. Now we're going to be trying to match a lot of patterns against our data, so let's write a function that will tell us which records match a particular pattern. Our function, show matches, takes the pattern and a list of strings, and then for each of those strings, if the pattern matches, we print out two stars as a marker, otherwise we just print out some blanks. Let's test our function right away. If we try to match 06 or 07 against the data that we read in earlier, it seems to be doing the right thing. 
we've got stars beside the two records that have month 06 or month 07. Why doesn't this work? If we match 06 or 07, it seems to be matching a lot of things that don't have the month 06 or 07. Well, think back to mathematics. The expression AB plus C means A times B plus C. Multiplication is implied simply by putting A and B next to each other, and it has higher precedence than addition. We always do multiplication before we do addition. If we want to force the other meaning, we write A times parentheses B plus C. The same thing happens with regular expressions. If we say 06 or 07, it means exactly what I said, either 06 or the digit 7. And if you look back at our data, there are a lot of 7s in our file. If we want to match 06 or 07, we can parenthesize as shown here. Having said that, the expression 06 bar 07 is probably more readable to most people anyway. Let's go back to our function and our data. If we do matches for 05, as we said earlier, we're pulling up records that have 05 as the day rather than as the month. We can force our match to do the right thing by taking advantage of context. If we want to match a month, there should be a dash before and after the numbers. So if we try to match dash 05 dash, we show no matches, which is the correct answer. We don't have any readings in this sample of our data set from May. Matching is all well and good, but what we really want to do is extract data. We want to pull the year, the month, and the day out of our data set so we can reformat them. Well, when a regular expression matches a piece of text, the regular expression library remembers what matched against every parenthesized sub-expression. So parentheses aren't just used for grouping, they're also used to remember things. So here's an example. The pattern to match years has been put in parentheses. This will match 2009 or 2010 or 2011, but it will remember which of those it matched. And the second string is just the first record from our data. And if you recall, backslash t represents a tab. Now when re.search is called, it returns a match object if a match is found. And if no match is found, it returns none, meaning there's no useful information. The expression match.group returns the text that matched a particular parenthesized sub-expression. For example, match.group of 1 returns whatever matched against the pattern inside the first pair of parentheses counting from the left. It's important to note that the first sub-expression is extracted with match.group of 1, the second with 2, and so forth. When we're looking at groups, we count from 1 to n, rather than 0 to n minus 1, as is normal in the rest of Python. The reason for this is that match.group of 0 returns all of the text that the entire pattern matched. Now, what if we want to match the month as well as the year? A regular expression to match legal months would be 01 or 02 or 03 or and so forth all the way up to 12. And the expression to match the day would be three times longer. This is pretty cumbersome. It's hard to type and more importantly hard to read. Well, in a regular expression you can use dot, the period character, to match any single character. So the expression dot 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 dash dot dot dash dot dot matches any four characters, exactly four characters, followed by a dash, followed by two more characters, followed by another dash, followed by two more characters. And if we put each set of dots in parentheses, we should get out three groups recording the year, month, and day every time there's a successful match. Let's test that out. Here we're calling re.search with the pattern we just described and the first record from our data and we print out match.group of 1, 2, and 3, sure enough, we get 2009, 11, and 17, just as we wanted. Try doing that with substring searches. To recapitulate, letters and digits in a pattern match against themselves. The character A in a pattern matches the character A in the data, and so forth. Vertical bar means OR, 
dot matches any single character, we use parentheses to enforce grouping, re.search returns a match object if the pattern matches, or none if there isn't a match, and if a match was found, match.group of k is the text that matched group k. More generally, stepping back from the details of regular expressions, the right way to build up patterns is to start with something simple that matches part of the data you're working with. Test it against your data, but also test that it doesn't match things that it shouldn't, because it can be very hard to track down false positives. Once you've done that, extend it piece by piece to handle other cases. If you recall, we have several notebooks full of data measuring background evil levels in millivaders. Notebook number one has these as site, date, and background evil level, with single tabs as separators. Some of the site names have spaces, and the dates are in the international standard format, with four digits for the year, two for the month, and two for the day. The data in notebook number two also has three fields, but these are separated by slashes. Months are reported using their names and are of varying length. The days are also of varying length. We saw in the previous episode that regular expressions are patterns that can be used to match text. Letters and digits match themselves, the vertical bar means OR, the dot matches any single character, you can use parentheses to enforce grouping, the re.search method returns a match object if a match is found, or none if one is not, and if a match is found, match.group of k is the text that matched parenthesized group k. Before we look at how to use regular expressions to extract data from notebook number two, let's see how we would do it with simple strings. If our record is the string shown in the first line of code, we could split on slashes to get the site, the date, and the reading, then split the middle field on spaces to get month, day, and year, and then remove the comma from the day if it is present, because if you recall, some of our readings don't have a comma after the day. This is a procedural way to solve the problem. We are telling the computer how to do something. Regular expressions, by contrast, are declarative. We tell the computer what we want, and it figures out how to do it. Our first attempt to parse this data relies on the star operator. Star means zero or more repetitions of the pattern that comes before it. It is a postfix operator, just like the two in x squared. So dot star means zero or more characters, because dot matches any character, and star forces the preceding pattern, the dot, to match zero or more times. In order for the entire pattern to match, the slashes have to line up exactly, because slash matches against itself, and that's why this seems to grab the site name, the date, and the reading correctly. Unfortunately, we've been over generous. Our pattern matches the string slash slash, and here we're printing out a star followed by the group so that you can see there actually are three lines of output. Dot star can match the empty string because that's zero or more occurrences of the character. And that means our pattern will accept badly formatted data, which is likely to cause us headaches down the road. Let's try a variation that uses plus instead of star. In a regular expression, plus is a postfix operator meaning one or more, i.e. it has to match at least one occurrence of the pattern that comes before it. And as you can see, the pattern dot plus followed by a slash, dot plus again followed by a second slash, and then a third dot plus doesn't match a string containing only slashes because there aren't characters before, between, or after the slashes for the dot pluses to match. If we go back and check it against real data, it seems to be doing the right thing. We're actually going to be matching a lot of patterns against a lot of strings, so let's write a function that will apply a pattern to a piece of text, report if there is no match, and if there is a match, print out all of the groups in order. And here we're testing our little function against the record we were just using. Well, if we're using regular expressions to extract the field, the entire date, and the reading, why not break up the date while we're at it? This pattern pulls out the month, the day, and the year at the same time as it pulls out the site and the reading. But wait a second, why doesn't this work? 
you probably didn't notice that this record does not have a comma after the day. And the pattern does have one, so this pattern doesn't match this string. Let's fix that by putting a question mark after the comma. In a regular expression, question mark is a postfix operator, meaning zero or one of whatever comes before it, i.e. the pattern before the question mark is optional. So now this pattern successfully matches data without a comma, and when we test it against data with a comma, it still works. Let's tighten up our pattern a little bit more. We don't want to match this record. Somebody's mistyped the year and given us three digits instead of four. Either that, or whoever took this reading was taking advantage of the physics department's time machine. We could use four dots in a row to force the pattern to match exactly four digits, but this won't win any awards for readability. Instead, let's put the digit four in curly braces after the dot. Curly braces with a number between them, in a regular expression, is a postfix operator meaning match the pattern exactly this many times. Here, we mean match dot four times against the string. Let's do a few more tests. Here are some records in which the dates are either correct or mangled. Here's a pattern should match all of the records that are correct, but fail to match all of the records that have been mangled. We are expecting four digits for the year, and we're allowing one or two digits for the day. The expression curly braces m comma n matches a pattern from m to n times. Here we're allowing from one to two characters for the day. When we run this pattern against our test data, we see that three records match. Now the second and third make sense. May 2nd is valid and May 22nd is valid, but why does May with no date at all match this pattern? Let's look at that test case more closely. The groups are Davison, that looks right, May, that's good so far, a comma on its own, which is clearly wrong, and then the right year and the right reading. Here's what's happening. The space after May matches the space in the pattern. The expression one or two occurrences of any character matches the comma, because comma is a character and it's occurring once. The expression comma question mark is then not matched against anything because it's allowed to match zero characters. Question mark means optional, and in this case, the regular expression pattern matcher is deciding not to match it against anything because that's the only way to get the whole pattern to match the whole string. And then, of course, the second space matches the second space in our data. This is obviously not what we want, so let's modify our pattern again. The pattern here does the right thing for the case where there's no day, and also does the right thing for the case where there are characters for the day. What's going on? Well, instead of using dot, we're using square brackets 0-9. In a regular expression, square brackets are used to create a set of characters. For example, the expression square brackets A-E-I-O-U will match exactly one vowel. It matches one instance of any character in the set. And you can either write these sets out character by character, as we've done with vowels, or, if the characters are in a contiguous range, write them as first character dash last character, as we've done with the digits. Here's our completed pattern, and we've added one more feature to it. The name of the month has to begin with an uppercase letter, i.e. a character in the set A to Z, followed by one or more lowercase characters in the set lowercase a to lowercase z. The day is one or two occurrences of the digits 0 through 9. Now this will allow days like 0, 0, 0, 99, and so on. We're going to check for that after we convert the day to an integer, because the valid range depends on which month we're in, and that can't easily be done declaratively. Think, for example, about how we would have to handle leap years. Finally, the year is exactly four digits, so it's the set of characters from 0 to 9 repeated four times. And again, we'll check for invalid values like 0000 
after we convert to integer. With the tools we've seen so far, we can write a simple function that will extract the date from either of the notebooks we're looking at and return the year, the month, and the day as strings. First, we test to see if the record has a match for an ISO formatted date, four digits for the year, dash two for the month, dash two for the day. If it does, then we're done. We return those three fields. Otherwise, we test the record to see if we can find the name of a month, one or two digits for the day, and then four digits for the year within slashes. If so, we return those, permuting the order so that it is year, month, day. And if neither pattern matched, then we return none to signal that we can't do anything. This is a very common way to use regular expressions. Rather than trying to combine everything into one enormous pattern, we have one pattern for each valid format of data. We test, and if the test succeeds, we return what we found. If it doesn't, we move on to the next pattern. Working this way is more readable. It's also easier to extend if we have to handle other data formats. If you recall, we have some notebooks with recordings of background evil levels in millivaders taken in the Shire a couple of years after the Death Star exploded. The data in these notebooks is in different formats. We're using regular expressions to parse them. In the last episode, one of the regular expressions we came up with was this complicated beast. It matches one or more characters, followed by a literal slash, followed by a single uppercase character and one or more lowercase characters, followed by a space, then one or two digits, an optional comma, another space, exactly four digits, another literal slash, and one or more characters at the end. That's a pretty complex match, and you might be asking yourself, how does it do it? The answer is, regular expressions are implemented using finite state machines. Here's a very simple finite state machine that matches exactly and only the single character lowercase a. We start matching with the incoming arrow on the left. It takes us to the first state in our finite state machine. The only way to get from there to the second state is to match exactly one character because the arc between state 1 and state 2 is labeled with the character A. The second state is marked with a dot in the middle to mean it's an end state. We must be in one of these states at the end of our match in order for the match to be valid. So now we have a finite state machine that matches the very simple regular expression A. Let's see if we can do something a little more interesting. Here's a finite state machine that matches 1A followed by zero or more A's. The first A gets us from the initial state to an end state, but we don't have to stop there. The curved arc at the top allows us to match another A and brings us back to the same state. We can then match another A and another A and so on indefinitely. Note that we don't have to stop in the end state the first time we reach it. We just have to be in the end state when we run out of input. What is the pattern? Well, it's A plus. 1A followed by zero more other A's is the same as one or more A's. Here's a finite state machine that matches against the letter A or nothing. The top arc isn't marked, so that transition is free. We can go from the first state to the second state without consuming any of our input. This is A or nothing, which is the same as A question mark, i.e. the optional character A. So now we have three patterns in our library. This regular expression looks like the one that matches one or more A's, except there's an extra arc to get us from the first state to the second without consuming any input. So this will match A star, i.e. nothing at all, taking that free transition from the first state to the second, or one or more A's. As you can see, we're building up a library of more and more complex patterns. The tools we've seen so far are enough to implement most of the regular expressions that we've encountered in the previous two episodes. Take a look, for example, at this finite state machine. What is the corresponding regular expression? We can either take the top root or the bottom. The top root is A plus. The bottom root is a B followed by either a C or a D. So this is A plus or 
B, C, or D. An input string that matches any of these paths will leave us in that final end state. The most important thing about a finite state machine is that the action it takes at a node depends on only the arcs out of that node and the characters in the target data. Finite state machines have no memory. They do not keep track of how they got into a state. All decision making is local to that state. This means that there are many kinds of data that regular expressions cannot match. For example, it is impossible to write a regular expression to check if nested parentheses match. If you want to see whether open parenthesis, open parenthesis, open parenthesis, and so on, followed by matching closed parentheses, are balanced, you need some kind of memory, or at least a counter, and there isn't any memory in a finite state machine. Similarly, if you want to check whether a word contains each vowel only once, the only way to do it is to write a regular expression with 120 clauses, because you need to check for each possible permutation of A, E, I, O, and U independently. You cannot write a regular expression that matches an arbitrary vowel and then subtracts that vowel from the set of vowels yet to be matched, because once again, that would require some kind of memory and finite state machines don't have any. If regular expressions are limited this way, why do we use them? There are two answers. The first is, they're really fast. After you do some pre-calculation, essentially after you compile the regular expression to create a finite state machine, regular expression can be matched against input by looking at each input character only once. That means the execution time only grows with the size of the data, and the time required for many other matching techniques grows much faster than the size of the input data. So while regular expressions are limited, the things they do, they do very, very well. Also, regular expressions are readable. And going back to our previous example, you might not think so, but imagine writing out a piece of code that matched that same input. The regular expression is much easier to read and probably more efficient than its procedural equivalent. And finally, regular expressions can do a lot more than the simple things we've seen so far. If you recall, we're trying to parse data from notebooks recording background evil levels in millivators at several sites in the Shire a couple of years after the explosion of the Death Star. These records are in different formats, and a couple of episodes ago, we managed to build this function to extract the dates from those records. Inside this function, we're applying a regular expression to the record if it matches, we're returning the matched groups, reordering them if necessary so that we always get back year, month, and day. This version of the function does a better job of pulling data out of our records. First, it gets the site and reading as well as the year, month, and day. Second, and more importantly, this function is more declarative. The variable patterns stores one entry for each format of record we think we have to parse. The first element of each entry is a regular expression to match data in that format. The remaining fields in the entry are a permutation of the indices of the groups in that pattern. In our loop, we pull the pattern and the indices for the year, month, day, site, and reading out of each entry in the table in turn. If the pattern matches, we then return the matched groups permuting them according to the indices so that the data always comes back in the same order, year, month, day, site, and reading. Why is this better? Well, every time we have another data format to match, all we have to do is add one more entry. This makes this function very easy to extend and very easy to test. So let's take a look at notebook number three. It has the date as three fields, the site name in parentheses, and then the reading. We know how to parse dates in this format. The fields are separated by spaces. But how do we match against those parentheses? So far, when we've seen parentheses in a regular expression, they haven't matched characters. They've created groups. The way we solve this problem, i.e. the way we match a literal open parenthesis or closed parenthesis using a regular expression, is to put backslash open parenthesis or backslash closed parenthesis in the RE. 
This is another example of an escape sequence, just as we use the two character sequence backslash t in a string to represent a literal tab character, we use the two character sequence backslash open parenthesis or backslash close parenthesis in a regular expression to represent the literal character open parenthesis or close parenthesis. However, in order to get that backslash into the string, we have to escape it by doubling it up. So the string representation of the regular expression that matches an opening parenthesis is actually backslash backslash open parenthesis. This might be confusing, so let's take a look at how the various layers work. Our program text, i.e. what's stored in our .python file, looks like this. And here we have two backslashes, an open parenthesis, two backslashes, and a closed parenthesis inside quotes. When Python reads that file in, it turns the two character sequence backslash backslash into a single literal backslash character in the string in memory. That's the first level of escaping. When we hand the string backslash open parenthesis backslash close parenthesis to the regular expression library, it takes the two character sequence backslash open parenthesis and turns it into an arc in the finite state machine that matches a literal parenthesis. Turning this over, if we want a literal parenthesis to be matched, we have to give the regular expression library backslash parenthesis. If we want to put backslash parenthesis in a string, we have to write it in our .python file as backslash backslash parenthesis. With that out of the way, Let's go back to notebook number three. The regular expression that will extract the five fields from each record looks like this. A word beginning with an uppercase character followed by one or more lowercase characters, a space, one or two digits, another space, four digits, another space, some stuff involving backslashes and parentheses, another space, and then one or more characters, which is the reading. If we take a closer look at that stuff, double backslash open parenthesis and double backslash close parenthesis are how we write the regular expressions that match a literal open parenthesis or close parenthesis character in our data. The two inner parentheses that don't have backslashes in front of them create a group but don't match any literal characters and we create that group so that we can save the results of the match. In this case, the name of the site. Now that we know how to work with backslashes in regular expressions, we can take a look at some character sets that come up frequently enough to deserve their own abbreviations. If you use backslash D in a regular expression, it matches the digits 0 through 9. If you use backslash S, it matches the white space characters, space, tab, carriage return, and new line. And backslash W matches word characters. It's equivalent to the set shown on the right of uppercase letters, lowercase letters, digits, and the underscore. This might seem a funny definition of word. It's actually the set of characters that can appear in a variable name in a programming language like C or Python. And again, in order to write one of these regular expressions as a string in Python, you have to double up the backslashes. Now that we've seen these character sets, we can take a look at an example of really bad design. Backslash S means non-space characters, i.e. everything that isn't a space tab, carriage return, a new line. That might seem to contradict what I said a few seconds ago, but that's an uppercase S, not a lowercase S. Similarly, and unfortunately, backslash W means non-word characters, provided it's an uppercase W. Upper and lowercase s and w look very similar, particularly when there aren't other characters right next to them to give context. This means that these sequences are very easy to mistype and what's worse, even easier to misread. Everyone eventually uses an uppercase s when they meant to use a lowercase s or vice versa and then wastes a few hours trying to track it down. So please, if you're ever designing a library that's likely to be widely used, try to choose a notation that doesn't make mistakes this easy. 
Along with the abbreviations for character sets, the regular expression library recognizes a few shortcuts that match things that aren't actual characters. For example, if you put a circumflex at the start of a pattern, it matches the beginning of the input text. So the pattern circumflex MASK will match the text mask size because the letters MASK come at the start of the string, but that same pattern will not match the word unmask going to the other end. If dollar sign is the last character in the pattern, it matches the end of the input text rather than a literal dollar sign. So TEMP dollar sign will match the string high temp, but it won't match the string temperature. A third shortcut that's often useful is backslash B, often called break. It matches the boundary between word and non-word characters. It doesn't actually match any characters. It doesn't consume any input, but it matches the transition between non-word characters and letters, digits, and the underscore. If we have break age break, it will match the string the age of because there's a non-word character right before the A and another non-word character right after the E. That same pattern will not match the word phage because there isn't a transition from non-word to word characters or vice versa right before the A. Our starting point is an archive of several thousand papers and theses written in LaTeX, a text-based document formatting program. Our documents look like this. They all use the same labels to refer to items in a shared bibliography. Our job is to find out how often citations appear together, i.e. how often paper X is cited in the same document as paper Y. As a first step, we need to extract the set of citation labels from each document, and that's the problem we'll tackle in this episode. Let's have a closer look at our input. In LaTeX, citations are written using backslash cite with cross-reference labels in curly braces. A single citation can include two or more labels separated by commas. There may be white space before or after labels. There can even be line breaks where a citation is split across two lines. And there can be multiple citations per line. Our first idea is to use a group to capture everything inside the curly braces following the word cite. It seems to work in one simple case, but what if there are multiple citations on a single line? It looks like we're capturing the text between the citations. The reason is that regular expression matching is greedy. It matches as much text as it can, and the dot in dot plus will match all the characters from the first curly brace to the last one, including the intervening citations and curly braces. Luckily, the diagnosis of our problem suggests its solution. Let's have the regular expression match everything except a closing curly brace. This is remarkably easy to do. If the first character in a set in square brackets is the circumflex, then the set is negated, i.e. it matches everything except the characters in the set. The expression square bracket circumflex closing curly brace closing square bracket therefore matches every character except a closing curly brace. This works for a single citation. All we've done is change dot to the negated set. What about multiple citations on a single line? Well, it's not gobbling up text we don't want it to, but it's only capturing the first citation. Somehow, we need to extract all matches, not just the first. Luckily, the regular expression library has a function to do exactly this. If we use re.findall instead of re.search, it will give us back a list of all the substrings that matched our pattern. Remember, whatever your problem is, someone has probably run into it before, and there's probably something in the library to help you. Knowing what's in the library is as important to a programmer as knowing what's in the literature is to a scientist. Let's give findall a try. It seems to produce the right output. Not bad for a seven character change. Okay, what about spaces in citations? The good news is nothing breaks. The bad news is the spaces are saved by findall, which isn't really what we want. We could tidy this up after the fact using string.strip, but let's modify the pattern instead. This modification solves half our problem. If you recall, backslash lowercase s is an abbreviation for the set of whitespace characters, so these uses of backslash s star match zero or more spaces immediately after the opening curly brace or immediately before the closing one. However, the space after the y is still being returned in the matched text. Once again, the problem is that regular expressions are greedy. The space after the y isn't a closing curly brace, so it's matched by the negated character set and included in the returned string. The backslash s star that's supposed to match the trailing space is then matched against zero characters instead of one. 
It's not what we want, but it's legal. Okay, so let's force our match to line up with the break from word to non-word characters using backslash b. It works. The change is to put backslash b after the first unwanted spaces and before the last ones. Since the curly braces around the citation labels are also non-word characters, the pattern matches even if there aren't any opening or trailing spaces. The last hurdle is to handle multiple labels instead of a single pair of curly braces. The pattern we've built so far doesn't explode when there are two or more labels, it even handles spaces after the commas, but it returns all those labels as a single lump of text. We actually could write a pattern that would break everything up on commas, but it would need some very advanced features of the regular expression library and would be very difficult to read. Instead, let's use another basic function, re.split, to separate multiple labels. re.split does the same thing as string.split, but unlike its simpler cousin, it breaks things up everywhere that a pattern matches. The best way to show re.split in action is to write the function we originally set out to create. Let's start with a skeleton that includes some test data, a function that does nothing but doesn't fail, and a couple of lines that call that function and display the result. So far, so good. Now let's write our function. For readability's sake, we'll put our patterns at the top and give them memorable names. Inside the function, we'll pull out all the citations using the first pattern, then split each result everywhere there's a comma with optional spaces before or after it. We'll stuff all the results into a set and return that. If no matches were found, that set will be empty. We can use one more trick from the regular expression library to make this function more efficient. Instead of turning the regular expression into a finite state machine over and over again, we can compile the regular expression and save the resulting object. That object has methods with the same names as the functions we've been using from our library, like search and find all. But if we're using the same pattern over and over again, compiling it once and reusing the compiled object is much faster. As you can see, the changes required are very small. Instead of saving the textual representations of our expressions, we compile them, and then instead of calling the top-level functions from the regular expression library, we call the methods of those saved objects. And here's the result. A set of all the citations in our test data pulled out with just a dozen lines